Story nine of Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, eighteen ninety six to nineteen o one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Keene. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, eighteen ninety six to nineteen o one, by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Lillian's Business Venture. Lillian Mitchell turned into the dry goods store on Randall Street, just as Esther Miller and Ella Taylor came out. They responded coldly to her greeting, and exchanged significant glances as they walked away. Lillian's pale face crimsoned. She was a tall, slender girl of about seventeen, and dressed in mourning. These girls had been her close friends once, but that was before the Mitchells had lost their money. Since then Lillian had been cut by many of her old chums, and she felt it keenly. The clerks in the store were busy, and Lillian sat down to wait her turn. Near to her, two ladies were also waiting and chatting. "'Helen wants me to let her have a birthday party,' Mrs. Saunders was saying wearily. "'She has been promised it so long, and I hate to disappoint the child. But our girl left last week, and I cannot possibly make all the cakes and things myself. I haven't the time or strength. So Helen must do without her party.' "'Talking of girls,' said Mrs. Reeves impatiently, "'I am almost discouraged. It is so hard to get a good all-round one. The last one I had was so saucy I had to discharge her, and the one I have now cannot make decent bread. I never had good luck with bread myself, either. That is Mrs. Porter's great grievance, too. It is no light task to bake bread for all those boarders. Have you made your jelly yet? No, Maria cannot make it, she says, and I detest messing with jelly. But I really must see to it soon. At this point a saleswoman came up to Lillian who made her small purchases and went out. "'There goes Lillian Mitchell,' said Mrs. Reeves in an undertone. "'She looks very pale. They say they are dreadfully poor since Henry Mitchell died. His affairs were in a bad condition, I am told.' "'I am sorry for Mrs. Mitchell,' responded Mrs. Saunders. "'She is such a sweet woman. Lillian will have to do something, I suppose, and there is so little chance for a girl here.' Lillian, walking down the street, was wearily turning over in her mind the problems of her young existence. Her father had died the preceding spring. He had been a supposedly prosperous merchant. The Mitchells had always lived well, and Lillian was a petted and only child. Then came the shock of Henry Mitchell's sudden death and of financial ruin. His affairs were found to be hopelessly involved. When all the debts were paid, there was left only the merest pittance, barely enough for house rent, for Lillian and her mother to live upon. They had moved into a tiny cottage in an unfashionable locality, and during the summer Lillian had tried hard to think of something to do. Mrs. Mitchell was a delicate woman, and the burden of their situation fell on Lillian's young shoulders. There seemed to be no place for her. She could not teach, and had no particular talent in any line. There was no opening for her in Willington, which was a rather sleepy little place, and Lillian was almost in despair. "'There really doesn't seem to be any real place in the world for me, mother,' she said rather dolefully at the supper-table. "'It is dreadful to have been born without one, and yet I must do something and do it soon.' And Lillian, after she had washed up the tea-dishes, went upstairs and had a good cry. But the darkest hour, so the proverb goes, is just before the dawn, and after Lillian had had her cry out and was sitting at her window in the dusk, watching a thin new moon shining over the trees down the street, her inspiration came to her. A minute later she whirled into the tiny sitting-room where her mother was sewing. "'Mother, our fortune is made. I have an idea.' "'Don't lose it, then,' said Mrs. Mitchell with a smile. "'What is it, my dear?' Lillian sobered herself, sat down by her mother's side, and proceeded to recount the conversation she had heard in the store that afternoon. "'Now, mother, this is where my brilliant idea comes in. You have often told me I am a born cook, and I always have good luck.' Now tomorrow morning I shall go to Mrs. Saunders and offer to furnish all the good things for Helen's birthday party, and then I'll ask Mrs. Reeves and Mrs. Porter if I may make their bread for them. That will do for a beginning. I like cooking, you know, and I believe that in time I can work up a good business. It seems to be a good idea, said Mrs. Mitchell thoughtfully, and I am willing that you should try. But have you thought it all out carefully? There will be many difficulties. I know. I don't expect smooth sailing right along and perhaps I'll fail altogether, but somehow I don't believe I will. A great many of your old friends will think, Oh, yes, I know that, too, but I'm not going to mind it, Mother. 
I don't think there is any disgrace in working for my living. I am going to do my best and not care what people say. Early next morning Lillian started out. She had carefully thought over the details of her small venture, considered ways and means, and decided on the most advisable course. She would not attempt too much, and she felt sure of success. To secure competent servants was one of the problems of Willington people. At Drayton, a large neighboring town, were several factories, and into these all the working girls from Willington had crowded, leaving very few who were willing to go out to service. Many of those who did were poor cooks, and Lillian shrewdly suspected that many a harassed housekeeper in the village would be glad to avail herself of the new enterprise. Lillian was, as she had said of herself, a born cook. This was her capital, and she meant to make the most of it. Mrs. Saunders listened to her businesslike details with surprise and delight. "'It is the very thing,' she said. "'Helen is so eager for that party, but I could not undertake it myself. Her birthday is Friday. Can you have everything ready by then?' "'Yes, I think so,' said Lillian briskly, producing her notebook. "'Please give me the list of what you want, and I will do my best.' From Mrs. Saunders she went to Mrs. Reeves, and found a customer as soon as she had told the reason of her call. "'I'll furnish all the breads and rolls you need,' she said, "'and they will be good, too. Now about your jelly. I can make good jelly, and I'll be very glad to make yours.' When she left, Lillian had an order for two dozen glasses of apple jelly, as well as a standing one for bread and rolls. Mrs. Porter was next visited, and grasped eagerly at the opportunity. "'I know your bread will be good,' she said, "'and you may count on me as a regular customer.' Lillian thought she had enough on hand for a first attempt, and went home satisfied. On her way she called at the grocery store with an order that surprised Mr. Hooper. When she told him of her plan he opened his eyes. "'I must tell my wife about that. She isn't strong, and she doesn't like cooking.' After dinner Lillian went to work, enveloped in a big apron, and whipped eggs, stoned raisins, stirred, concocted, and baked until dark. When bedtime came she was so tired that she could hardly crawl upstairs, but she felt happy, too for the day had been a successful one. And so also were the days and weeks and months that followed. It was hard and constant work, but it brought its reward. Lillian had not promised more than she could perform, and her customers were satisfied. In a short time she found herself with a regular and growing business on her hands, for new customers were gradually added and always came to stay. People who gave parties found it very convenient to follow Mrs. Saunders' example and order their supplies from Lillian. She had a very busy winter, and, of course, it was not all plain sailing. She had many difficulties to contend with. Sometimes days came on which everything seemed to go wrong, when the stove smoked or the oven wouldn't heat properly, when cakes fell flat and bread was sour and pies behaved as only totally depraved pies can, when she burned her fingers and felt like giving up in despair. Then again she found herself cut by several of her old acquaintances, but she was too sensible to worry much over this. The friends really worth having were still hers. Her mother's face had lost its look of care, and her business was prospering. She was hopeful and wide awake, kept her wits about her, and looked out for hints, and learned to laugh over her failures. During the winter she and her mother had managed to do most of the work themselves, hiring little Mary Robinson next door on especially busy days, and now and then calling in the assistance of Jimmy Bowen and his hand-sled to carry orders to customers. But when spring came, Lillian prepared to open up her summer campaign on a much larger scale. Mary Robinson was hired for the season, and John Perkins was engaged to act as carrier with his express wagon. A summer kitchen was boarded in in the back yard, and a new range bought. Lillian began operations with a striking advertisement in the Willington News, and an attractive circular sent around to all her patrons. Picnics and summer weddings were frequent. In bread and rolls her trade was brisk and constant. She also took orders for pickles, preserves, and jellies, and this became such a flourishing branch that a second assistant had to be hired. It was a cardinal rule with Lillian never to send out any article that was not up to her standard. She bore the loss of her failures, and sometimes stayed up half the night to fill an order on time. Prompt and perfect was her motto. The long, hot summer days were very trying, and sometimes she got very tired of it all. But when, on the anniversary of her first venture, she made up her accounts, she was well pleased. To be sure, she had not made a fortune, but she had paid all their expenses, had a hundred dollars clear, and had laid the solid foundations of a profitable business. Mother, she said jubilantly as she wiped a dab of flour from her nose and proceeded to concoct the icing for Blanche Remington's wedding cake, don't you think my business venture has been a decided success? Mrs. Mitchell surveyed her busy daughter with a motherly smile. Yes, 
I think it has, she said. End of Lillian's Business Venture Recording by Andrea Keene